Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. There may be no greater unanswered question in the universe than the possibility of extraterrestrial life. Do aliens exist? If so, where are they? How many are there? Do extraterrestrial civilizations exist? There are no easy answers to those questions. It's the biggest question in the universe, and scientists are no closer to answering it. Do aliens exist? Or are we humans totally alone in the universe? Stargazers have spent much of the past century trying to solve this conundrum and have made several unexplained observations along the way. Once these puzzles are solved, we may finally prove that aliens do exist, or we may get one step closer to discovering that humanity is the only life form in the universe. Of course, we won't know whether extraterrestrials are real until they get in touch with us. Well, many people believe that has already happened with more than one type of extraterrestrial visiting our planet and making themselves known. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! This is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the podcast and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you're already a weirdo, please share the podcast with others. Doing so helps make it possible for me to keep creating episodes as often as I do. Coming up in this episode… The Warren Commission concluded in 1964 that the same magic bullet that struck President Kennedy then also proceeded to slice through multiple layers of skin, bone, clothing, and muscle tissue, taking a strange and unbelievable zigzag pattern, lending credence to the single-shooter theory. But many thought the idea was ludicrous. Now it appears the magic bullet theory may not be as crazy as it sounds reports have been coming in for centuries, even through modern times, of a creature in the Congo that, by all descriptions, looks to be a living Diplodocus or Brachiosaurus. They call it Mokeli Mbembe. But first, when it comes to close encounters of the third kind, we immediately think of the tiny gray aliens made famous in film and television. But there are more species than just the grays many more. We begin with that story. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Some say an alien civilization existed before mankind was born on planet Earth. Others say aliens from another planet came to Earth and helped mankind to be born. They believe those aliens come to Earth from time to time, keeping track on us humans and how we're progressing, looming over us like gods. Here are some unknown to most of us alien races that have been in contact with Earth at least according to those who believe in extraterrestrial visitations. We'll start with the most obvious and well-known of the aliens, the Greys. The Greys supposedly come from a star system known as Zeti Reticuli, which is a star system located somewhere in the southern celestial hemisphere and are thought to be one of the alien races in contact with Earth. At a little over 40 light-years away, they're practically our closest neighbors the type of neighbors that you conveniently forget to invite over for a dinner party. 
If we had to pick out one particular race in the cosmos and call them the bad guys, it would definitely be these guys. Tall and humanoid with a long head and distinctive gray features, they are the most commonly depicted alien life form in our media, and they are also the beings that are most commonly described by alien abductees who have been returned back to Earth. The greys have the greatest tendency to be involved in abductions because they like to stockpile humans. They think of Earth the way that you would a chicken farm, just brimming with genetic material that they can't wait to get their hands on. They come to Earth to pick up a juicy selection, then take it home to do Cosmos only knows what. On the off chance that they're not happy with their selection, they bring it back and choose another. The Sasani Hybrids are particularly common across the cosmos and are believed to be of an alien race in contact with Earth. Some even believe that we humans are genetic hybrids ourselves, but that's a discussion for another time. The Sasani aliens are a hybrid that was developed from reptilians and gray humans. We'll look at the reptilians in just a moment. Their development was found to be necessary after the greys mutated themselves through genetic experimentation to a point where they could no longer reproduce using conventional means, that is, alien sex, and were only able to spawn new generations by cloning themselves. Cloning is well and good if you want to create new beings, however, it gives no genetic variation over successive generations, which could lead to problems. So they came to Earth and convinced a few people to share our genetic information with them. From this genetic crossover, the universe was blessed with an entirely new type of being, the Sasani, who in a way are like our interstellar cousins. They were then given their own planet and allowed to roam free and evolve into the best beings that they can be. The Sasani have a stronger connection with their higher selves and are believed to be where humans will one day be, although they are millennia ahead of us and are one of up to 15 alien races that are actively engaged in humanity's conscious awakening. The Arcturians Of all the species known believed to inhabit the Milky Way, the Arcturians are the most ancient and the wisest. They are said to be one of the alien races in contact with Earth. If Yoda came from any one of the alien species on our list, it would probably have been this one. Theirs was the first system to be given the gift of life in our galaxy, and all the other species, ours included, may have descended from them. They've mutated and evolved over their time, and they now exist in many forms. The main race of Arcturians stand to about five feet tall, with green skin and large eyes that can see right through you. Just like most nerds, this race's development of their minds rather than their bodies make them small in stature, so you could probably take one of them on in a fistfight, but their advanced intelligence means that if any alien species out there knows how to use the Force from Star Wars, these guys would be it. Thankfully, they do have a reputation for being the most kind and loving beings in our galaxy, so if you do manage to tick one off, then you must really be a douchebag of galactic proportions. The Nordics the Nordics look like Norse gods. Blonde with brilliant blue eyes and the bodies of six-foot-tall, finely-toned athletes. You can see where the Scandinavians got their inspiration for Thor from. The Greys got a lot of attention when it comes to alien sightings, but the Nordics are a species that come into contact with humans almost as much as the Greys. However, they are more interested in the well-being of the human race than the Greys are. Even though some eyewitness reports claim to have seen Nordics in the same alien craft as Greys. A possible explanation for this is that the Greys were slaves or servants to the Nordics, as a Grey's lack of empathy makes it an ideal butler. The Pleiadians The Pleiadians come from a bright star cluster known as the Pleiades and are one of the beings in the Milky Way that closely resemble humans. They are thought to be one of the alien races in contact with Earth, therefore you could be sitting in a room with one right now and not even know it. A major difference between us and them is that they are particularly sensitive to the psychic energies that are constantly streaming across the universe. 
This means that the best way of reaching out to one of them would be by concentrating or sending out psychic messages. Put simply, if you really want to meet up with Pleiadians for a cup of tea or a few brews, just sit down and meditate on it. Whether they choose to show up or not depends on how much they're feeling your psychic energy. So sending messages like, get your interstellar butts over here, well, that's not likely going to work out well for you. The Yael There's been a lot of talk about which race will be the first to officially disclose their presence to Earthlings. The one that alien experts, assuming you can call them experts, all seem to agree on is the Yael. This is one of the alien races in contact with Earth and is known to be kind and loving, and they have been touted as the best beings to make first contact with us due to their advanced and harmonious relationship with technology, something that we here on Earth are having a little trouble balancing out. Whenever a new invention comes about, we weaponize it first, and then feed the hungry second. The Yael know that we're not the friendliest beings out there, so they're taking their time to make themselves known by easing their way in our psyches with friendly UFO sightings, such as the March 1997 sighting known as the Phoenix Lights that they claim responsibility for. During that event, they gave thousands of people across the state of Arizona and North America a spectacular light show, and there's even video for anybody who missed it. The Anunnaki if human beings were able to successfully colonize another planet, what would be the first thing we'd do? We'd pillage it for resources, of course, which is exactly what the Anunnaki did when they arrived on Earth. They came from Planet X, also known as Nibiru, an almost mythical planet that some scientists believe rotate around our Sun on a very wide elliptical orbit that takes it far out into the expanses of space before coming back in for a close shave with our Sun. This crazy elliptical orbit is what makes its presence so hard to prove. However, the presence of the Anunnaki has been noted down in texts that date back to Mesopotamian cultures. They're believed to be one of the alien races in contact with Earth. Anyway, on Nibiru's last brush with the planets of the inner solar system, it crashed into another rock, and the resulting collision created a planet that we now call Earth. While their planet was here, a few of the Anunnaki hopped off of their world and onto ours in search of a yellow element that they covet, called gold. You ever wondered why gold is so valuable? Yeah, it's shiny, but it doesn't do anything useful like heal the sick or produce energy. So why do we as a species desire it so much? We desire it because the Anunnaki desire it, and while they were here they enlisted us as their workforce to mine it for them. That's right. Our entire existence is based on working our socks off every day so that our alien overlords could have their fix of gold and other precious metals. Isn't that grand? The Alpha Draconians The Anunnaki was one of the alien races in contact with Earth, but were not the first race involved in the racket of mining minerals on our little blue planet. Before them were the Alpha Draconians. Standing up to 22 feet tall, these badass beings are made up of pure muscle and resemble dinosaurs or dragons. As you can imagine, they were very unhappy when the Anunnaki showed up and took over. However, they are still active on our planet, with puppets placed in the high echelons of government as they bide their time in an attempt to take over once again. The Reptilians before the Anunnaki stopped by and genetically engineered a bipedal workforce to dig up dirt for them, there was a race of intelligent beings who lived here and is thought to be one of the alien races in contact with Earth. We know them as the Reptilians. Scaly and standing to about the size of a human being, they were driven underground by the Anunnaki, where they are said to still reside today in a network of complex underground tunnels. Those that are open-minded and curious might be able to find these tunnels and pop in for a visit. However, considering that we're the reason that they can't come up for a breath of fresh air, it's likely that they'll skin you alive and leave your skeleton on a stick hanging outside the entrance as a warning to any other scaleless punks who decide to invade their territory. You've been warned. The Namos 
Some alien species choose to interact with certain tribes on Earth that they just happen to get along with better. The Scandinavians had the Nordics and the Dogons. A tribe indigenous to Mali in northern Africa had the Namos, who hailed from the brightest star in our night sky, Sirius. And then there's the Dogons. The Dogons knew centuries before modern science caught up that Sirius is actually made up of three stars, and they even knew how long it took for Sirius B to go around Sirius A. Considering that they were millennia away from inventing devices powerful enough to see Sirius close up, it makes sense that they had visitors from that section of the galaxy who told them about it. I do have one last alien species to share with you. They're called the Kate, and they're supposedly from Sirius A. And the reason I know this is because I have been accused of being one of those aliens. I'm not kidding. A few years ago, when I was still performing stand-up comedy, I did an interview with somebody and they asked me what I thought about being accused of being an extraterrestrial living on Earth. Well, if you want to know more about that and read it for yourself and also watch the video that I created about it, I have posted that in the Weird Web section of WeirdDarkness.com and I have a link directly to that in the show notes. It's definitely entertaining. Mokeli Mbembe is the name given to a creature believed to inhabit the upper reaches of the Congo River Basin – that is, the Congo, Zambia, and Cameroon – as well as in the Lake Teli in the Republic of Congo and its surrounding regions. The name originates from the Lingala language, and it's commonly translated to mean one who stops the flow of rivers, said to be a reference to the creature's supposed preference for nestling in the bends of rivers. Mokeli Mbembe is also said to be the word for rainbow, as well as mystery, according to Paul Olin, a missionary who has spent more than a decade living with the Bayaka Pygmies of Congo and the Central African Republic. Over the years, numerous physical descriptions of the Mokeli Mbembe have been provided. The various accounts generally agree that the creature is enormous in size and has a long neck with a small head, as well as a long tail. In some accounts, the Mokeli Mbembe is also said to be an herbivore that lives in caves by the river, where it could find its favorite food, a certain type of liana. Despite its vegetarian diet, though, it is thought that the Mokeli Mbembe would act aggressively if approached by people. In one account, it's said that the beast has a single horn, perhaps like a rhinoceros, with which it would kill elephants. There are also claims that the Mokeli Mbembe is a spiritual rather than a physical being. The first report of the Mokeli Mbembe by Westerners dates back to 1776, and it's attributed to a French missionary in the Congo River region by the name of Lievin Bonaventure Proyart. The missionary reported that he had seen enormous footprints, about a meter or 3.28 feet in diameter, with claw prints of some type of animal in that region. The creature that left these footprints, however, was not sighted. No further reports about the Mokeli Mbembe were made until the early part of the 20th century. In 1909, an explorer by the name of Lieutenant Paul Gratz wrote about a creature similar to the Mokeli Mbembe known as the Nzanga. This creature is found in the legends of the natives living in present-day Zambia, and it's rumored to inhabit the Lake Bangwulu region. Gratz's report is important because it's the first account that describes the animal as dinosaur-like. Since then, it has been commonly accepted that the Mokeli Mbembe is some kind of dinosaur. Around the same time, Carl Hagenbeck, a renowned German big game hunter, claimed that he'd heard about the beast as well. In his autobiography, Beasts and Men, Hagenbeck wrote that he was told about a huge monster, half-elephant, half-dragon that was living in the depths of the Great Swamps, in the interior of Rhodesia, an unrecognized state that once occupied the territory which we know today as Zimbabwe. Hagenbeck also wrote that, quote, I'm almost convinced that some such reptile must be still in existence. At great expense, therefore, I sent out an expedition to find the monster, but unfortunately 
they were compelled to return home without having proved anything, either one way or the other. Hagenbeck may have been the first Westerner to have led an expedition to find Mokeli Mbembe, but he would certainly not be the last. As recently as 2011, over 50 expeditions had been carried out to find the creature. Apart from alleged footprints, fuzzy photographic images, and a deluge of eyewitness reports, including one in which a missionary claims to have been acquainted with some pygmies who killed a Mokeli Mbembe during the 1960s, there is a lack of indisputable evidence to prove the existence of the creature. In addition to the absence of hard evidence, the existence of the Mokeli Mbembe is doubted based on several factors. For example, it has been argued that if the Mokeli Mbembe is a prehistoric dinosaur, as many claim, then it is highly unlikely for it to be just one animal or a few individuals. If the Mokeli Mbembe had survived unchanged in the Congo River Basin for the last 65-some million years, then there must be a sizable population of them. Enough physical evidence, such as skeletal remains or feces, would have been left behind by the creatures and should have been found by now. But we made the same argument about something that we thought was similar to Bigfoot, big, hairy, sometimes bipedal, which we later found to be the great apes. Another argument against the existence of Mokeli Mbembe draws from the experience of zoologists who search for species believed to have gone extinct in recent history. If one intends to rediscover a presumably extinct animal, one would need to conduct multiple searches. It's been found that if such a creature still exists, it would usually turn up after three to six searches were conducted, after which the probability of its existence decreases. Given that over 50 expeditions have been conducted, the likelihood that the Mokeli Mbembe exists at all seems to be pretty slim. Nevertheless, there are those who have not given up and who fervently believe that the Mokeli Mbembe will one day be found. The most prominent of these are the creationists, who hold the view that the Mokeli Mbembe, if found, would provide hard evidence for the literal interpretation of the biblical account of creation. They also believe the existence of such a creature would serve to discredit the claims of evolutionists, as the Mokeli Mbembe would be proof that dinosaurs reproduced after their kind, not evolving from or into other life forms. Considering what's at stake, it's likely that the hunt for the elusive Mokeli Mbembe will continue for some time to come. Up next, the JFK assassination and the theory of the magic bullet. Experts are looking at the idea again, and it may not be as crazy as it sounds. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises, but those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you, so much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does, so he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past – absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts.
On November 22, 1963, Lee Harvey Oswald fired off a shot with enormous repercussions. The bullets that left his bolt-action Carcano M9138 rifle from a sixth-floor window of the Texas School Book Depository in downtown Dallas killed the President of the United States. And depending on who you ask, one of those bullets defied the laws of physics as we know them. On Oswald's first or second shot, a 6.5-millimeter bullet hit President John F. Kennedy in the back, to the right of his spine and then left his body through the front of his neck. It exited below his Adam's apple, hit the necktie knot, and continued into Texas Governor John Connolly's back and shattered his fifth right rib bone. After exiting Connolly's chest, the bullet entered the governor's right wrist, breaking yet another bone before exiting and burrowing into his left thigh. Oswald's third shot was the clincher, hitting Kennedy square in the skull and changing the course of history forever. One of the shots, either the first or the second, missed. At least, that's what the official government-sanctioned Warren Commission concluded in its September 1964 report. With a growing distrust in the government during the mid to late 1960s and a flurry of books suggesting there was an internal conspiracy at play to kill the president, the single bullet or magic bullet theory garnered as many detractors as genuine believers. The Warren Report was upheld in 1979, though the single bullet theory, which some call the magic bullet theory, remains one of the most hotly contested claims the government has ever made. The theory was central to bolster the government's assertion that there was only one shooter and that that shooter was Lee R.V. Oswald, since Oswald's rifle wasn't fast enough to shoot multiple bullets in the time frame when both Kennedy and Connolly suffered their initial injuries. Let's take a look at what the official narrative specifically proposed and outline some of the most pertinent facts that either support or refute its most important point – that one bullet injured both President Kennedy and Governor Connolly. Critics of the single bullet theory have dubbed it the magic bullet theory, mostly because of decades-old misconceptions surrounding the relative placement of Kennedy's and Connolly's bodies in their shared open-air limousine. After a quick Google search, you'll find all sorts of squiggly-lined drawings and diagrams showing the bullet's supposedly physics-defying path from Kennedy's mid-back up to his Adam's apple, over to Connolly's back, up to his wrist, and straight down and over to Connolly's left thigh. This interpretation is not limited to the depths of the internet, though. In Oliver Stone's 1991 film JFK, for example, a New Orleans district attorney played by Kevin Costner reenacts the shooting in front of a rapt jury. With a squiggly-lined diagram behind him, he describes Exhibit 399, or CE399, the Magic Bullet's official name, turning right, then left, right, then left before making a dramatic U-turn in order to hit all of Kennedy's and Connolly's points of injury. The blockbuster film was nominated for eight Oscars and reignited the Magic Bullet debate for a new generation. So now a single bullet remains. A single bullet now has to account for the remaining seven wounds in Kennedy and Conley. But rather than admit to a conspiracy or investigate further, the Warren Commission chose to endorse the theory put forth by an ambitious junior counselor, Arlen Specter, one of the grossest lies ever forced on the American people. We've come to know it as the magic bullet theory. The magic bullet enters the president's back, headed downward at an angle of 17 degrees. It then moves upward in order to leave Kennedy's body from the front of his neck, wound number two, where it waits 1.6 seconds, presumably in midair, where it turns right, then left, right, then left, and continues into Conley's body at the rear of his right armpit, wound number three. The bullet then heads downward, at an angle of 27 degrees, shattering Conley's fifth rib and exiting from the right side of his chest, wound number four. The bullet then turns right and re-enters Conley's body at his right wrist, wound number five. Shattering the radius bone, the bullet then exits Conley's wrist, wound number six, makes a dramatic U-turn and buries itself into Conley's left thigh, wound number seven, from which it later falls out and is found in almost pristine condition 
on a stretch in the corridor of Parkland Hospital. That's some bullet. Anyone who's been in combat will tell you never in the history of gunfire has there been a bullet this ridiculous. Yet the government says it can prove it with some fancy physics in a nuclear laboratory. Of course they can. Theoretical physics can prove that an elephant can hang from a cliff with his tail tied to a daisy. <laughs> But use your eyes, your common sense. The Army wound ballistics experts at Edward Arsenal fired some comparison bullets. Not one of them looked anything like this. Take a look at CE-856, an identical bullet fired through the wrist of a human cadaver. Just one of the bones smashed by the magic bullet. Seven wounds, gentlemen. Tough skin, dense bones. This single bullet explanation is the foundation of the Warren Commission's claim of a lone assassin. But CE-399's supposed twists and turns, as actor Kevin Costner points out here, they're based on a gross misconception of how Kennedy and Connolly were situated in their limousine. In the JFK courtroom scene, the men standing in for the president and the governor are seated in chairs that are the same height, one directly in front of the other. Given that layout and the placement of the two men's injuries, it seems like the bullet would have had to defy gravity to hit all the right marks. But that's not how the limousine seats were laid out. In reality, Connolly's seat was lower and further to the left. And based on photographic and video evidence, we know the president was seated all the way to the right of his back seat, his arm resting on the frame of the car. And so the bullet didn't have to turn right and left over and over again. In fact, if you place Kennedy's and Connolly's bodies correctly, their injuries form a practically straight line. What's more, magic bullet theorists point to the fact that the place where the bullet entered through Kennedy's jacket was supposedly lower than the exit wound on his neck. There's no way a bullet shot from a gun pointing downward would suddenly shoot up while in the president's body. But that point is also based on faulty evidence. Photographs from the moments before the shooting show that Kennedy's jacket was bunched up at his neck, and so the entry point on his coat is in fact lower than where the bullet actually entered his back. Thus, the up-and-down, left-to-right seesawing that the magic bullet supposedly had to pull off in order to make all of Kennedy's and Connolly's injuries didn't happen at all. In fact, it's possible that CE-399 traveled in a virtually straight line, from Kennedy's back all the way to Connolly's thigh. The investigation into Kennedy's death and the single bullet theory didn't conclude with the Warren Commission. The theory would be tested again and again, both by the government and by independent forensics enthusiasts over the following decades. Among these tests was a confidential March 1965 report issued by ballistics experts at the U.S. Army's Edgewood Arsenal in Maryland. Using the same type of rifle and bullets that killed Kennedy, the scientists tested the theory on a slew of gelatin blocks, human skulls, and goat skins to recreate the effects of body parts on a bullet's velocity and trajectory. While their tests confirmed that the bullet that wounded the president had enough remaining velocity to account for all of the governor's wounds, they found it more difficult to draw a firm conclusion on whether the two men were actually injured by the same bullet. According to their tests, Governor Connolly's back and chest wound could have been produced by either the shot that hit President Kennedy in the neck or by a separate shot. If it was a separate shot, the report concluded, then the bullet that hit the president in the neck must be accounted for. They recommend that a very careful reenactment of the assassination be done to see whether it was possible that the bullet that struck Kennedy in the back could have missed the car and its occupants completely. It's not clear whether such a reenactment was ever performed, though the House Select Committee on Assassinations confirmed the single bullet theory in a 1979 report. Still, the committee itself muddied the waters when it concluded in that same report that four, not three bullets were fired, and that one of those bullets came not from the Texas School Book Depository, but from the so-called Grassy Knoll, an open part of Dealey Plaza the president's motorcade drove through when he was shot and killed. 
The committee based its conclusion on an audio recording from a Dallas police officer. An acoustical analysis of the tape identified four gunshots, with the echo pattern indicating that one of those shots came from the direction of the grassy knoll. The National Academy of Sciences performed its own analysis of the tape after the committee issued its report and found that the House's audio analysis was riddled with flaws. There was no evidence of a fourth gunshot or a second shooter. But the damage to public perceptions had already been done. President Kennedy was pronounced dead at Parkland Memorial Hospital at 1 p.m. that day. Lee Harvey Oswald was found and arrested less than an hour later. Oswald told reporters that he didn't shoot anybody. He famously called himself a patsy two days before nightclub owner and police informant Jack Ruby murdered him on live television, silencing him for good. While Ruby himself claimed he was acting out of vengeance for the Kennedy family and that killing Oswald had nothing to do with a broader conspiracy involving shadowy players within the government, that secondary incident left many suspicious and dubious to this day. With the alleged lone gunman dead, the possibility of having him divulge any information contradicting the single-bullet theory was now gone as well. There was hardly widespread acceptance of the Warren Report's findings, not even within the federal government. In 2013, it was revealed that President Kennedy's own brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy, considered the Warren Report a shoddy piece of craftsmanship. Half of the Warren Commission was skeptical of the single-bullet theory. According to journalist Philip Shannon, who wrote a book about the Kennedy assassination, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., a friend of the Kennedys, said Robert Kennedy was convinced the Warren Commission's lone gunman story was false. Schlesinger said that in December 1963, Robert Kennedy told him that he feared Oswald was merely part of a larger plot, whether organized by Castro or by gangsters. He added that two years after the Warren Report was published, Robert Kennedy remained convinced that there was a conspiracy and wondered out loud how could he continue to avoid comment on the report. It's evident that he believes it was a poor job. Debate around the magic bullet theory has substantially shifted in recent years thanks to the advent of modern 3D simulation technology. About 50 years to the day after Kennedy's assassination, one father and son forensics team used these technological advances to put the single bullet theory to a more rigorous test, assessing the trajectory of Oswald's bullet more precisely than ever before. We can envision crime scenes more thoroughly, more completely than we ever had the capability to do, said Michael Haig in an interview with CBS. So we walk away from the crime scene with more information and we can then examine the crime scene over and over later on on a computer. What the duo found, according to Luke Haig, was that the one bullet could easily have gone through two people, if you understand how this particular unusual bullet behaves and what it does after it leaves Kennedy's body. People didn't understand then and don't understand now, he said. It will go through a lot of material and then when it comes out it starts tumbling, and that's how it hit Connolly. It's like a badly thrown football, it normally flies true and straight. When this bullet emerged from Kennedy, or any ballistic medium, it's now yawning and tumbling. The entry wound in Connolly is very important because it's the consequence of a yawed bullet, so it had to be a destabilized bullet from somewhere. This informed reevaluation has, of course, been starkly different than Prosecutor Arlen Specter's presentation of the bullet's trajectory in court decades earlier. Using a mere rod and two adult males in a replica of the Lincoln limousine, it was simply too primitive for doubts to persist in comparison to Luke and Michael Haig's work. When asked if he thought one bullet could do the damage witnessed in Dallas that day in 1963, Michael Haig said, as far as the neck wounds to the president and the wounds to John Connolly, absolutely. He added that the argument of Oswald simply not being a good enough shooter to pull it off was yet another unfounded misdirection. According to Luke Haig, Oswald's rifle wasn't as inaccurate as so many detractors claim. If the bore in the rifle is good, it's a good shooter, and it was a good shooter, he said, unfortunately for President Kennedy. 
The question about multiple shots, the behavior of the bullet that goes through Kennedy and becomes the single bullet theory, became controversial because, again, people didn't evaluate it, they didn't understand it, and they hadn't looked at it then and few have looked at it now. John McAdams, a political science professor at Marquette University in Wisconsin and an expert on the Kennedy assassination, would likely agree with the Hagues. Thomas Canning was a NASA scientist who studied the single bullet trajectory for the House Select Committee on Assassinations, he wrote on his website, referring to the theory being upheld by a congressional committee in 1979. The result was an alignment that showed the bullet leaving Kennedy's throat to strike Connolly in the back near the shoulder, which is where Connolly was actually struck. McAdams also studied a computer recreation of the bullet's trajectory from the 1990s. Failure Analysis Associates, in work done for a 1992 mock trial of Lee Harvey Oswald for the American Bar Association, used 3D computer animation and modeling techniques to research the bullet trajectory and concluded that the single bullet trajectory works. We want to think there's more to it than a lone, loser, deranged Marxist who hated this country and took an opportunity, said Luke Haig. There's got to be more to it than that. Vincent Bugliosi, the famous prosecutor, has a wonderful statement. A peasant cannot strike down a king. Thanks for listening. If you like the podcast and you haven't already subscribed, be sure to do so now so you don't miss future episodes. And also, please, tell someone else about the podcast. Recommend Weird Darkness to your friends, family, and co-workers who love the paranormal, horror stories, or true crime like you do. Every time you share the podcast with someone new, it helps spread the word about the show, and a growing audience makes it possible for me to keep creating episodes as often as I do. Plus, telling others about Weird Darkness also helps get the word out about resources that are available for those who suffer from depression. So please, share the podcast with someone today. Do you have a dark tale to tell of your own? Fact or fiction, click on Tell Your Story on the website, and I might use it in a future episode. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Alien Races That Have Contacted Earth was written by Adriana John. Dinosaur in the Congo was by Wu Mingren. The Truth Behind the Magic Bullet Theory was written by Marco McGarritoff, and the audio clip used in that story is from the Warner Brothers film JFK, directed by Oliver Stone. Weird Darkness Theme by Alibi Music. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 21, verse 2. All a man's ways seem right to him, but the Lord weighs the heart. And a final thought. Be not afraid of life. Believe that life is worth living, and your belief will help create the fact. William James. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.